Let's start with the Lakers. The Lakers game last night gave you really a glimpse of everything the Lakers are. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, Anthony Davis got hurt again and didn't play great. Yeah, I've seen that. D'Angelo Russell, a couple of big shots, but had a plus minus of minus 16. Dennis Schroeder, how can you be in the league this long and still make those mistakes? Austin Reeves had moments, but there's clearly a ceiling. He was trying too hard last night. And LeBron saved the day. That's kind of what the Lakers are. They're a very limited offense. It's a, it's a low-ceiling offense with two great players, one brittle, one old and brittle, uh, with a defensive coach. The good news is, thankfully, Memphis is worse. Memphis shot 39% from the field and 21% on three-pointers. John Morant is spectacular. They've got all sorts of offensive issues and a bit of a fraud as a team. They've got depth, but are a long way from contending for a title. Um, the reason, though, the Lakers should be optimistic is that on their good nights, they're very good in the fourth quarter. They can hand the ball to still one of the top 10 players in the league. And AD, although not last night, can be a top seven player. And because the Clippers are all beat up, the Suns have old, brittle players. The Warriors are old and Sacramento's probably too young. So there's a reason some years in the Oscars, you have four or five good movies right, that could win the Oscar. This is one of those years in the Western Conference where, like, American Beauty or uh, The Shape of Water would win the Oscar. There's not a lot of great out there. And the, the Lakers over the last three years, if you really watch them play a lot, LeBron in the last three years, since the bubble championship, has been waiting for AD to take the baton. He's not going to ever. He did for about three weeks at the end of the regular season. So LeBron kind of... He lets the game come to him. That's why the Lakers are 18th in the NBA in first quarter scoring. LeBron is begging his teammates to get up and going. They never do because Malik Beasley and Jared Vanderbilt and Dennis Schroeder and D'Angelo Russell, they're bounce around the league guys. But the Lakers are also with all these bounce around the league guys first in fourth quarter scoring. How is it possible? Because LeBron now is a highly efficient player. He starts slow, crosses his fingers that AD stays healthy, and they can take a lead. They usually let him down, so he has to be a good second quarter player to keep it close in half and a great closer. And last night was LeBron at his best. It had a lot of MJ. Picked his spots, and then at the end of the regulation and in overtime, he was the best player on the floor. 22 points, 20 rebounds, the ultra-rare 2020. It feels like this Laker move by LeBron has been two parts. He first comes to L.A. to build up his business, move off a lot of the young guys, get A.D., and it got him a championship. This is the second version of it the last few years, where he's waiting for A.D. to take the baton and be the guy. Because at this point, if you look at the contracts, they're not going to rebuild with stars. They tried the Westbrook thing. It didn't work. Trade deadline, they move parts. It's a lot of Malik Beasley's, Jared Vanderbilt's, D'Angelo Russell, and driven and ascending but limited Austin Reeves. LeBron's wanted to hand that thing over to somebody and be the number two guy, but last night, once again, great late, fourth quarter scoring. They lean into Le LeBron in year 20, and he delivers. Okay, the Jets and the Packers delivered the trade. So the way it works in the NBA... Whoever gets the star in a trade wins the trade. But it's different in football, right? Because football offensively is about choreography. If a quarterback who's pretty good, Russell Wilson, gets a bad coach, Nathaniel Hackett, it gets ugly fast. You can be a really good quarterback and you have a bad left tackle and there's injuries. Matt Stafford, you're banged up. The O-line's banged up. And you can go from winning the Super Bowl to into the tank. So it's different. In the NBA, whoever gets the stars, five B players and draft picks don't equal the star. And there are some potholes for Aaron Rodgers in New York. They have a young defensive head coach, defensive head coach that's unproven. The division's good. The conference is great. Ownership, no thanks. And many of the Jets' best players are young, first, second-year players. Not ideal for an old, prickly veteran. But the Jets should still win this trade. And the reason being, they were so bad at quarterback last year, unwatchable, 
to a past-his-prime Hall of Fame-level quarterback who can still on any Sunday be great. That alone should change the culture, the attitude, and the locker room in New York. The fact the Jets won seven games last year is hard to imagine. It's hard to wrap your brain around. They were 29th in scoring. Between the two quarterbacks, they had 15 touchdowns and 15 picks, or maybe it was 14 touchdowns and 14 picks. It was awful. They were second to last in passing touchdowns, and yet they won seven, seven games. It's hard to imagine how they did it. So infusing Aaron into a franchise that has not been on Sunday night football in like 12 years. The Jacksonville Jaguars have won, not just been in, have won three playoff games. Since the Jets were last in the playoffs, the Lions get to the playoffs more regularly now than the Jets. So to go from that quarterback and that offense to Aaron Rodgers, from the optimism, the attitude, the cultural belief, it should really be a game changer for them. But the Packers are on a different timeline. If Jordan Love even becomes Kirk Cousins with a little mobility, they find out by Thanksgiving, we got our guy. He's good enough to win this division. Maybe not every year like Favre and Aaron Rodgers, but he's a franchise quarterback. That's a win for them. Even if they find that out and go 8-9 and nine and don't make the playoffs, there's a feeling of optimism for the Packers. 8-9 and nine for the Jets, the timeline's different. That's a disaster. Aaron may play one year. So when people talk about who won the trade, the Jets have to be great immediately. And there's a chance for it. Going from Zach Wilson, Mike White to this. It should be just a, re a, a referendum on new football, optimistic football, home runs, over the top. It's not a complete offensive roster. But it's the difference between a hailstorm and bright blue skies. The day feels different, and it should with Aaron. For Green Bay, if they find out at any point in this season, Jordan Love is good enough to be a franchise quarterback. You know what? Post Favre and Aaron Rodgers, that is a win. And I think it's possible. Maybe probable. I don't know. I've said before, I don't think Jordan Love's going to be a top 8-9 quarterback. If he was, they would have seen it, and they would have not signed Aaron to an extension, considering all the drama he created last three years. But I also don't think he's a disaster. An E.J. Manuel, um, you know, a Zach Wilson, where you kind of feel like pretty early, this isn't going to work because then they would have re-signed Aaron again. I kind of feel he's somewhere, Jordan Love, between 12 and 20. And again, if he's 90% of Dak, kind of Kirk Cousins with a little mobility, I think it's a win for Green Bay. And I have no idea if that's true. We've seen virtually no proof he's great or terrible. We don't know. But for the Jets today, you go from that to bright blue skies, feels like a win for them. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.